Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And this is certain to be a very informative and visually engaging lunchtime talk. Um, my name is Joy Carey. I'm the Prony Digitization Manager. Um, and I join you all in my love as well for historic photographs and their ability to visually transport us back in time. And as you're all here, because you're interested in the history of photography in Ireland, I'd like to invite you, if it's geographically possible for you, to visit Prony before the 7th of April, that's a Friday, to view our current exhibition, which is An Artist's Eye, the photography of Mary Alice Young of Galgorm Castle. There are 100 photographs from this Prony collection of over 1,200 glass plate negatives dating from the 1880s to the 1920s, which are currently on show in the atrium of our building here in the Titanic Quarter in Belfast, along with some archival material as well from the Galgorm papers. So it's now my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Orla Fitzpatrick to everyone. Orla is a photographic historian and curator based in Dublin. She's written widely on 19th century Irish photography. She's currently research fellow on Ireland's border culture, um, which is a research project between Queen's University in Belfast and Trinity College in Dublin. And that's funded by the North South Research Programme. Um, before I pass you over to Orla, I'd just like to say as well, if you could mute yourself on entry and we're recording sorry, you are muted on entry by the system. We're recording this um, talk today. So if you don't want to be seen um, on the recording, please turn off your cameras. So to hand over to Orla, who's talking on the Photographic Guild, a circle of Cavan and Monaghan photographers in the 1890s. So over to you, Orla, thank you. Thank you very much, Joy. And thank you for asking me to give this talk and to Prony as well. Um, but let me see now. So between 1892 and 1899, the circle of friends from Belturbet and Kilachandra contributed successfully to the photographic competitions run by the English journal Heart and Home. You can see a cover or a poster here advertising that journal. So this weekly broadsheet, which was published in London between 1891 and 1914, sold for threepence and was aimed at the upper middle class woman. So it contained advice on how to manage servants, along with serialised fiction, gossip columns, household tips, fashion plates and advertisements. So the tone of the journal was very much one of self-improvement and the competitions tied in with this ethos. So the competitions were also used as a means to encourage repeat purchase and to make readers feel like they were part of a larger community. So the column entitled The Photographic Guild began in December 1891 and was and it awarded financial prizes and certificates. So the editor, the photographic editor, evaluated photographs with regard to subject matter, focusing, printing and mounting. And images were occasionally reproduced within the magazine. And I think that's quite interesting that they weren't always reproduced. Um, so the existence of this column is an indication of the growing popularity of photography during the decade. So photography was also becoming an increasingly attractive hobby for women. And this is reflected in their greater participation in societies such as the Photographic Society of Ireland. So although the majority of the competition entrants were from, from the UK, the Cavan photographers featured mainly, largely amongst the prize winners, with a high number going to Anna Godley, Killigar House, Kalashandra, and Nellie Eleanor Clifford from Cairn Cottage in Belturbet. So the eight local entrants were Mr. Douglas G. Adams, formerly of Glinch House, New Bliss, New Bliss County Monaghan, his sister Frances Adams, so the Clifford sisters whom you can and cousins whom you can see pictured here. And you'll have to excuse perhaps the broken up nature of some of the reproductions here because we don't have the original of the photographs. We only have what was reproduced in the magazines using half tone printing process. So the other entrants were a Miss N Crawford Rowe from Cabra House in Cavan, Miss Anna Godley of Kilbracken, Kiligar, and finally a Mr. Vincent Ireland, a Dublin born RIC inspector, who was briefly stationed in Kilachandra. So in a geographic area where photographic clubs were not commonplace, a competition such as this provided an outlet for creativity and also for, afforded, afforded at the circle a chance to acquire expert advice and feedback. So it's interesting to note that the only Irish contributors to this competition during this period were from this small geographic area. 
with the exception of two other Dublin entrants. So by the 1890s, photography was becoming an increasingly popular pass practice and prepared glass plates were commonly available. Um, this photograph here shows Carn Cottage where the Clifford family lived and um, it's a very unusual site in that it's overlooking, um, overlooking uh, a lake. This is the current disrepair that it was in, um, but it was a pretty large establishment, very unusually styled and dating from the 1790s with some additions from the 1780s. So as I said, by the 1890s, photography was becoming increasingly popular pastime and prepared glass plates were commercially available. James Lancaster and Sons of Birmingham were one of the leading manufacturers of reasonably priced cameras, which they sold to the growing numbers of amateur photographers. So this is an ad here from the 1880s, um, and it shows that John Gannon of Caventown was selling Lancaster cameras and Ilford photographic plates in 1895. Um, he was also selling them alongside wallpaper and coffins. Um, another establishment in Cavan Town was Patterson and Patterson practiced both photog hairdressing and photography. I think this is quite telling as well that these weren't solo businesses dedicated to photography. They had different things on the go at the same time. And a notice in the Anglo Celt on the 17th of July 1897 informed customers that he had removed his salon, salon and studio to more commodious premises at number two Bridge Street where he hopes by first class work and strict attention to both branches of his business to merit a continuance of the patronage bestowed in the past. C.F. Wynne and his sold his work through Mrs. Malcolmson's Main Street cabin and also at Mr. Connolly's Coot Hill and his advertisement stated that outdoor work was a speciality. So I think these notices demonstrate that there was a market for photographic equipment and portrait amongst cabins upper and rising middle classes during the 1890s. But I also think it's likely that the Photographic Guild members who I'm discussing today um, sent to Dublin, Belfast and London for more specialised papers and equipment. So the entrants included two members of two branches of the Clifford family. The most successful contributor, Nellie Clifford, was from Cairn Cottage, which I showed previously, Belturbet, and she entered the competitions under the pseudonym of Ellen Derlific, uh, an anagram of her own name. Her cousins from nearby Grenville House, Ardlocker, were also keen photographers. Miss E. Clifford and Mr. C. Clifford entered the competitions as Van Jan and Shark's Mouth. So the family worshipped at Kildallan Church of Ireland, which is pictured here, and several family members are buried there. Now, another element that I've been exploring of this circle is that both branches of the Clifford family had long associations with India. Many family members served in either the British Army or the Civil Service. An aunt and an uncle of Nellie's were killed in the rebellion of 1857, and an inscription in the Nicholson Cemetery at Kashmir Gate, Delhi, reads as follows, and this is a quote from the Indian um, Memorial. Sacred to the memory of MJA, Mary Jane Clifford, daughter of Captain R.M. Clifford, Cairn Cottage, County Cavan, aged 24 years, who was cruelly murdered on the 11th of May, 1857, in the Palace of Delhi, when on a visit to the Reverend J. Jennings, also to the memory of Wigram Clifford, brother of the above, Bengal civil service, aged 23, who died having shared all the dangers of the siege of Delhi, fell in an attack on an outpost at Mawatis near the village of Alipur in the Gorgon district on the 31st of October, 1857. So we think that Mary Jane had traveled to India to look after her brother's house and was in Delhi preparing for a friend's wedding at which she was to be bridesmaid when violence broke out. So it's highly probable that she was sent to India to find a husband, a practice that was increasingly commonplace by the mid 19th century. And we can see this in the families that we're discussing here in their lines. Increasingly, we have this Indian element where people who women who were born in, in Ireland going to India and meeting men who were born in India. And there's this cross 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 uh, pollination within the census returns where you may have somebody who was born in India, somebody else born in Ireland, born in, um, born in England. So all living in Cavan at the same time. 
So Nellie's uncle, Richard Henry Clifford, completed 25 years service as resident magistrate and collector in Bengal, India. He was about to retire when he died of fever in Almora, India in October 1876. Her father, Lieutenant General Robert Clifford, served in India between 1858 and 1913. Nellie's maternal grandfather, Marge Trent, worked for the East India Company. So these links go right back. Her mother and her cousin Edith were also born in India. It appears that her parents spent the early years of their mar marriage in India, as Nellie was born in West Bengal in 1866. However, census records show that her younger sister, Cecil Murray, was born in Dublin in 1873. So I think the above connections provide evidence of the role played by Irish people in the maintenance of British rule in India, an area that has received increased attention from historians in recent years. Um, it also demonstrates that even in this relatively remote areas, there are contacts with and they were influenced by wider events throughout the world. So both Cairn Cottage and Grenville are now in ruins. However, the description of the accommodation at Kern, which was offered when it was offered for sale by GAG Coffee in 1933. And this is an area that I'm also looking at is when were these houses sold on? When were they dissolved? Um, did they make it into the new state? Um, and what was the crunch point? Also, all of these things have big implications for unmarried daughters of the families and where they go to live. Um, so as I say, um, Karen Cottage, Cottage was offered for sale in 1933, and it shows that it was an extensive establishment, which included 100 acres, at least 20 outbuildings, including an engine room from which electric light was generated, and a main dwelling which contained three reception rooms and five bedrooms, all of which enjoyed central heating. The sale of the contents of the house later that year also reveals the extent of the family's estates. So Grenville, we have a notice here for the sale of Grenville, was a similar establishment with numerous reception rooms and bedrooms. Whilst neither houses nor estates are extremely large, they demonstrate the comfortable living which was enjoyed by these military and civil service families. According to family history, there were six unmarried daughters at Grenville and four at Carran Cottage, and these cousins undoubtedly provided companionship for one another. So Church of Ireland families and other and families from other parishes in, in Cabin um, also provided opportunities for friendship and it's highly likely that the godly Adams Clifford families met on a regular basis. Um, we know little really about Nellie Clifford um, who was one of the most successful photographers during this period. Um, she married another uh, competition contributor Douglas Gerald Adams in 1897 and he's pictured here. Um, when entering the photographic competitions, Douglas Adams gave his address as Kilishandra County Cavan. Um, his family, however, came from Glinch House, which you can see here. It's sold recently uh, via Christie's, um, which was in New Bliss County, Monaghan. Um, so although in another county, it was only 24 kilometres from Karen Cottages. So magazines such as Heart and Home had a predominantly female audience although Betham has noticed that it was not unusual for male readers to contribute to competitions and letter pages. Um, in the absence of another outlet for his photographic endeavours, the magazine allowed Adams to display his work to a wider audience. Um, another regular contributor to the competition was Miss F. Adams, who went under the pseudonym Van Jan, and it's probable, probable that that was uh, Douglas's sister, Frances Florence, Adam, Florence Adams. She was born in July 1865 and married William Joseph Hamilton of Castle Hamilton, Kinalshandra, in 1897. So these are all people of the same age, born around the same decade, and they're moving on and marrying or not marrying or moving out of houses all at the same time. Um, so as it is not known whether or not Nellie and Douglas met through their shared interest in photography. Um, as I said, the Church of Ireland community in Cavan and Leitrim Monaghan was quite small and close-knit, and it's highly probable that they would have known each other through family collections. So I also feel that the railway network facilitated their um, photographic photography and socialising. So this image here so shows the extensive rail network in the counties, which meant that a train could be taken from Kilishandra to Ballaturbet, Clonus or Cavan. So this map here is from a later period, but it is before these networks were um, dismantled. 
So unusually, there are other ads within the Heart and Home magazine, and the Cavan Circle also used a small advertisement section of the journal to sell farm produce, such as butter and poultry, outside of Ireland. So in 1895, a notice offered delicious Irish butter for one shilling and five, five pence around per pound, along with primroses, which could be posted free by Nora, who gave her address as the post office, Kilishandra County Cavan. Uh, another notice offered plump chickens at five, 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 five shillings per pair, trust free, sent on Thursday once weekly by Miss Jones, called Bracken House, Belturbet County Cavan, Ireland. So it's interesting to think that these were being offered outside of Ireland and sent on by a train and postal networks. Um, this prefigures the establishment of Kilishandra Cooperative Society in 1897, of which Nellie Clifford's father was president. And again, it shows that the goods and people and ideas could be moved, moved from these rural locations with these due to these postal and rail networks. So getting back to Nellie Clifford, it appears that she was a very talented photographer. She won the overall prize in the Guild on two occasions. June 1893 and May 1894, and on both occasions her entries were portraits. She was awarded many honourable mentions and second prizes, and her photographs were mentioned at least 14 times in the column. Her photographs received high praise from the column's judge, for example, this is a quote from the editor, the judge, um, your photo well deserves second prize. The effect and light of light and shadow is capital and the focusing good. I have sel seldom seen a softer or more artistic portrait. It appears that there was a lively exchange of um, lively exchange of ideas and comments between Nelly and the editor. Nelly suggested possible subjects for future competitions. Um, so Nelly adapted and honed her photographic skills, experimenting with several different processes. She switched to a large former camera in 1894, and she, along with Anna Godley of Kiligar, also entered the competitions in the Junior Photographer, um, a journal aimed at the serious amateur photographer. The following spreads revealed that she was also wrote substantial um, advice columns and thematic pieces on photography. For example, um, this one, this one on how to photograph animals, which was published in September 1895. As mentioned before, the processes were no longer as time consuming as they had been in the mid decades of the 19th century, but it still required considerable dexterity and patience to print the images. And Nelly refers to several of the pitfalls which could occur when taking photographs and printing photographs. Um, Problems with focusing under and over exposure and torn printing paper are all mentioned in this piece by Nelly, also published in the Junior Photographer in 1895. Um, this is on the theme of house and home, and it includes an exterior of Kern Cottage. It's on the left there, quite faded. And that's the building that we saw earlier. Um, and we also, which is now in ruinous condition. And it also includes photographs of the interior of these buildings, quite cluttered, very Victorian style. And there are photographs on the wall. So um, she gives advice on what whereabouts to be in the room and about lighting and where lighting will come in from, and also qu some quite technical details. So the subject matter and competition themes, which were selected by journals such as Heart and Home and the Junior Photographer, were more akin to art, the art photography movement than to the snapshot typically taken by those who were used the more simple Kodak cameras. They included the following, and these are, you know, you were set a competition and you'd to respond, send in your entry, and then it would either be published or you'd get feedback. Um, so the topics were such as a picturesque building, um, an artistic group of children, partners, friends, that sort of thing, and you'd to then respond with your photograph and you got your written response. The editor repeatedly used phrases such as artistic and picturesque in reference to the successful photo photographs. Chandler in his work entitled Photography in Ireland to the 19th Century has noted that, and I quote, artistic photography was a style to which the majority of serious amateur photographers in Britain and Europe aspired to during the years between 1880 and the late 1930s. So it seems that Nelly and her group considered themselves to be serious amateurs this is demonstrated by their entrance into competitions over a prolonged period of time. It's also illustrated by the use of a variety of printing processes and toning techniques, 
And also Binelli's switch to a large format camera when more simple models were available. So unfortunately, Nellie's story is a sad one. Soon after her marriage in January 1897, Nellie's contributions to the magazine end. She was to die in childbirth at the end of 1897, having given birth to a daughter, Violet Eleanor Sheila Adams. The 1911 census shows that DGM and um, Adams had remarried this time to a woman from Cyprus. Again, we have this uh, network of empire entering into the story and that Nellie's daughter was living in Dublin with him. Another successful contributor was Anna Godley. And I've written previously about Anna Godley in um, a series of books called um, Leitrim History and Society, and also in an article for Breffney Historical Society. So um, there is quite a lot written about her in terms and compared to the other women. Um, so I'll just I'll just give a brief idea of her practice here. So Anna Godley was of Killigar House, Carrigallan, County Leitrim. Sometimes she gives her address as Cavan, sometimes as Leitrim. Her family were landowners whose Leitrim holdings were in excess of 2,000 acres. The photograph, this photograph by Godley is entitled Feeding the Hens, um, and it was published in the Town and Country Life competition in the Junior Photography Photographer, Volume 11, Number 4, 14, September 9, 1895. So the feedback from the editor is that it is a very good indeed, but movement is discernible in the principal figure. So in the absence of any surviving diaries or letters, it's only possible to get an indication of Anna's personality through the narratives written by several male family members. Her cousin, the World War I General Alex Alexander Godley, refers to the summers he spent hunting in Leitrim in the 1890s and states that, and I quote, in this, in this and the fishing in lakes, which was the lovely, which, which this lovely place abounds, my cousin Anna was as always a guide, philosopher and friend. A photograph which is reproduced um, in a yearbook shows Anna with a hunting party at Killigar in 1892. It appears that she was a formidable character who took over the running of Killigar estate after her father's death in 1907. John Godley stated that his, and I quote, great uncle Archie was long dead and his only child, my cousin Anna, spinster, spinster of 64, was in command. She was a splendid character. Anna was a frequent contributor to the Photographic Guild and her photographs are mentioned by the editors on at least 15 occasions. And her works included portraits, still lives and landscapes. She won several prizes and the editor noted on the 29th of August, 1895, that the subject was well chosen, as well as the focusing and the time of exposure being quite accurate. The printing and mounting were very neat. Amongst other protest processes, the column mentions Anna's use of the platino type in 1893 and 1894. So this process provided uh, a great tonal range and was widely available after the 1880s. So images printed on platino type papers were noted for their detail and matte surface of the print. And it's just this characteristic which probably led the editor to note that Anna's platina type had reproduced well. Anna was also concerned about the toning of her photographs and toning was the means of enhancing the overall color um, of a photographic print and usually involved the use of gold chloride bats which gave a rich sepia tone. Um, so this was very important and it's not really put across in the magazines which weren't reproducing them well but the print was very important for amateurs of, of this period and um, the tone involved quite specialized processes. So further evidence of Anna's uh, sophisticated photographic work is provided by her use of the blue printing process known as the cyanotype which appears on several pages of her photographic albums um, and it was an unusual use of the cyanotype process. Um, Godley also contributed photographs to The Lady of the House, which was an Irish version of Heart and Home. And this women's magazine included the usual sections of competitions, etiquette, advice, and fashion plates. Um, this journal, which ran between 1890 and 1923, it gives us a valuable insight into the concerns of a particular class of Irish woman during the period. And Anna's photographs of the lake at Killigar won first prize in this journal's competition. Another portrait was also successful, and this event warranted commentary in the Leitrim Advertiser as follows. 
um, we are very much pleased to notice that Miss A. Godley, daughter of Archibald Godley, has been awarded one of the amateur photographer prizes, which were offered by the lady of the house for a very capital portrait of the Bishop of Kilmore. So in addition to her competition entries, Anna compiled photographic albums and the National Library of Ireland's photographic archive holds three of these, which are attributed to her. So the images within these albums are slightly of a more documentary nature, I would say, than the artistic landscape and still lives, um, which were entered into the competitions. And also the local studies uh, section of Leitrim County Library holds 180 glass plates and prints made by Anna. And these images also cover her state life and her travels in Europe. So this slide shows her portrait of the Bishop of Kilmore, as mentioned previously. And he's in a, it's a relaxed and naturalistic pose. Also shown in the photograph is somebody who's just named as Mills, only her surname is given, a member of the staff at Killigar. Um, in addition to her regular contributions to the competitions, Anna's um, albums and prints at the Leitrim Library and the National Library constitute, I think, a, a pretty unique record of life in Leitrim area during the late 19th century. And for this, I'd also, also like to reference the work of Liam Kelly, who has done considerable um, research into the photographic uh, representations of that county. So Anna's albums contain fewer artistic subjects, such as the still lives or landscapes, which were submitted to Hart and Home and Junior Photographer. Um, the sitters in the photographs include members of the local families who were either tenants or servants on the estate. And surnames can be traced to that area still to this day. So we have the Bleakleys, Bowes, Coonies, Gahans, Gilpin, Grimes, Hamilton, Saunderson, Taylor, Chutes, Whites and Woods. And many of these stage workers share the same religion as the Godleys. They're quite unusual in Ireland in that there's quite a few English born estate workers at certain levels that were brought into the country. Um, however, it's likely that most of the tenants were resident in the area for many generations. Um, the 1901 census shows that a farmer named John Bleakley was living at Killigar with his wife and three children. And he's included in the album. He was born in Leitrim in 1864, 1846. So I'm going to conclude um, with a brief reference to the family who lived in Cabra House, the Crawford Rose. Um, and like the Cliffords at Cairn Cottage, they had a long association with India. Um, Eliza Matilda Rowe, whose work featured in Heart and Home, was born in 1872. And her birth cert gives the place of birth as Peshwar, Bengal, Bengal India. In the 1901 census, the then 28-year-old Eliza Matilda was visiting with the Cliffords of Carn Cottage, again, another connection. Eliza's father, Alexander Clifford, was a surgeon in the British Army, writing numerous reports on sanitation and conditions. Um, his birthplace was Ballyconnell County Cabin, though his family's association with, the East, with India stretched way back going to the East India Company. He studied medicine in Edinburgh. Eliza's brother, Samuel George Rowe joined the Royal Inniskillen Fusiliers and died in World War I um, at the age of 29. Another sibling died in childhood in India. Um, so these connections are going back. Um, now, in addition to her heart and home um, photographs, she also produced this. So I bought this postcard, I'd say about 15 years ago on eBay, and I didn't buy it for its highly colored depiction of the Kashmir Gate, but for the attribution on its verso, which states that the postcard was published by E.M. Rowe, Cabra, Coot Hill, County Cabin, and it's part of her India series. Um, I've come across very few other copies of this, and I've traced only one other image in the series. Um, what we do know is that Eliza's father was to die in 1915 and that there was a subsequent dispute covered in the newspapers over the will between and the dispute was between her uncle and her brother. Um, there's very little mention of the daughters. The daughters are not mentioned in, in the will. And Eliza was to die in England in 1956 with an address at a caravan park in Bexhill, Sussex. So what also interests me about this group is as unmarried sisters and daughters, what was the fate of these women whose entitlement to property was pretty limited? Um, there's also the element of, and I've increasingly been looking at perhaps their political allegiances. Some of them signed the Ulster Covenant. 
Um, do they see a future for themselves in the new state? Um, so I think there is a combination of here of why some of them ended up moving away, partly due to the fact that these houses were dissolved or that one brother or one uncle took over and had the houses. And what did they do then? Um, what was their out? What was their fate um, as spinsters, the phrase which is repeated so often? So I think the life and the life stories of women such as Anna Godley, Nanny Clifford and Eliza Rowe are often absent from history, especially if they did not mar mar marry. And I hope perhaps with this little bit of research that I've um, shed some light upon their concerns and their lives and this unique culture that was um, prevalent in Cabin Monaghan and Fermanagh at the time. And um, also shed some light upon their photographic practice and what they sought to represent. Um, so I'll leave you with that, if that's okay. Thank you.